watch my exclusive content not featured anywhere on YouTube, log on to my website at I'm just here to make you think dot com slash films. Okay everyone, now allow me to open this video with acknowledging those of you who may have just recently discovered my channel for the very first time, and encourage all of you to go back and watch my previous documentaries, as they will in fact answer the majority of the same questions that I have received from you all, and even my most common viewers during the most earliest days of my channel's existence back in May 2016. Now, of course, I'm about to share some very distinctively detailed information with you concerning this particular topic at hand, because just like all of my other documentaries, this information is very critical when it comes to all Americans, and especially to those who are the direct descendants of the indigenous Aboriginal Niji of this land now called North America. To uncover the truth about this topic, let's go back in time a little to where the Congress of the Confederation of the American Union authorized the design and implementation of the first official copper coin on April 21st, 1787. This copper coin was allegedly designed by Benjamin Franklin, meaning that there is no record of this, just the story, where this coin was later dubbed as the Fujio Cent. This Fujio scent has a very uniquely interesting history about itself. For example, while being worth one third of a dollar at that time, it borrowed its near entire design yet from another coin that was worth an entire dollar at that time but it never circulated, called the Continental Dollar of 1776. What is very important to note here is what's displayed on the Fujio scent. Located on the front side of the coin is a sun and a sundial, in which it is just above the phrase, mind your business. History says that the meaning of the phrase, mind your business, is to quote, do your work, time flies. Keep that in mind. Now on the other side of this coin are 13 rings, which are chain linked perfectly together to represent the 13 states, with the phrase, we are one, displayed directly in the middle. Now, from a quick glance, this may seem like your average coin which happens to provide a few words of motivation. However, the engraved images and phrases found on this coin all have a double meaning. What I mean by that is, it initially served as a hidden form of communication that only a small group of elitists were cognizant of its actual meaning at that time, in which it depicted a start of a particular prominent timeline, while also carrying along a much darker hidden agenda that details more untold historic information concerning the so-called copper-colored people in America. For example, the word Fugio is a Latin word that means I fly or flee. But with more distinctive researching, you'll soon discover that the word fugio derived from yet another Latin word called fugiri, which means to drive away or to make flee. In other words, the word fugio literally means to make something disappear. Now, as we go further along throughout this timeline, you'll see exactly how this deceitful hidden agenda was carried out. In the year of 1855, a descendant of second generation South African immigrant parents who migrated from Africa to New London, Connecticut in the late 1780s, Galusha Aaron Grow, a member of the Democratic Party, House of Representatives, and Speaker of the House, 
all from 1851 to 1863, had a change of heart and switched to the Republican Party, allegedly due to the signing of the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. But what's very odd about that is that Grow was the sole author and creator of the Homestead Act of 1862, in which the Kansas-Nebraska Act served as its precursor with multiple southeastern copper-colored indigenous nations being removed from the lands of Kansas and Nebraska, along with other lands of the West. Now, keep in mind that these exact same native tribes or nations were forcefully immigrated with an E to lands west of the Mississippi River and into Kansas and Nebraska, for example, due to the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Side note, the story surrounding this removal was also known as the Trail of Tears. Now, with this Kansas-Nebraska law in effect, this propelled the government to remove these Indians yet again. Some were placed in so-called reservations, while the majority of others were placed in areas that they called plantations. On the other hand, white settlers who were still immigrating to North America were treated benevolently and given these lands and farms that were literally stolen from our indigenous ancestors. This was also clearly mentioned by Martin Luther King just a few days prior to his assassination. You may watch more about that in my documentary called What Martin Luther King Was Trying to Tell You But You Didn't Listen. Now with all of that being said, this now brings us to the second one cent coin of this timeline. It is called the Flying Eagle Scent, which depicts the removal of the copper color indigenous Niji, with an engraved image of an indigenous eagle facing or rather flying towards the left, indicating which navigational direction they were forced to walk. This coin was minted in the year of 1856, during the same time that Galusha Gro had his change of heart that I mentioned earlier and also during the same time that he began formulating the Homestead legislation, which was essentially passed and signed into law by then-President Abraham Lincoln in 1862. Now, the very next copper coin that was minted just two years later was the Indian head cent in 1858. The Indian head cent became immensely popular during this time period amongst the white immigrants for a very particular reason. And what is this reason you ask? Well, again, it is more so pertaining to what this copper coin depicts. See, the US Mint in Philadelphia's chief engraver by the name of James Barton Longacre enrolled and participated in a competition for the design of the next planned copper cent before becoming the chief engraver during the year of 1835. All participants of this contest were made aware that a dozen Indian chiefs will soon be visiting the President of the Union, or rather the United States, in hopes to make peace and come to the agreement of sharing their Indian territories with the already unwelcomed incoming white colonizationalists, and that the winner of this contest will have their design of the next mint shown to the President, personally, soon after the quote, meeting with the great white chief of the white people adjourned for final approval. What is very important to note here is that those particular Indian chiefs that I just mentioned did in fact go to meet with the president. However, this meeting dubbed as the quote, meeting with the great white chief of the white people by Congress happened exactly 28 years after 1835 well beyond the completion of this contest. The Indian chiefs were invited by then President Abraham Lincoln to Washington DC in March of 1863. And in this meeting, it was said that much talk of peace allegedly arised between Lincoln and the Indian chief's interpreter, in which several treaties were created and agreed upon by both parties in order to quell the Indians from raiding and rebelling against the still newly incoming white colonizationalists and their families who immigrated from many parts of Europe and Africa to North America, even throughout this particular time period. 
These newly established treaties also made it clear that the Indians would be left alone to live their lives peacefully on their own lands. But these very same treaties were immediately broken, as well as the promise to honor the indigenous aboriginals with their image as the design to this particular coin. Now, let's jump back a bit here, because in the year of 1835, James Longacre and all other contestants were specifically ordered to create their designs of images of Indians on the front. But instead, James sketched an image of his flaming red-haired 12-year-old Dutch daughter named Sarah wearing an Indian headdress. With the approval of his wife, James's sketch became his contest entry, and when asked by political figures in charge of this contest, which Indian chief is your sketch depicting, James replied and revealed that the image is not of an indigenous person to America, but of his young Dutch daughter. So, the Indian head scent is not of an image of Miss Liberty as some authors of history loves to claim, no. Because the truth is that James's sketch became the official image of the initial Indian head sent exactly 24 years later during the year of 1859. So in other words, instead of placing an image of an indigenous person as promised during the meeting in Washington, they purposely utilized an image of a pale faced immigrant in place of it, depicting exactly what their real agenda truly was. Side note, there is a big reason why they so desperately want to change the Washington Redskin name and logo. And no, it is not because it's some racial slur neither. Which brings me to my very next point. The last one cent coin within this timeline is formerly known as the Lincoln cent coin, but nowadays most commonly known as the penny. On the front side of this coin, there was an engraved alleged image of Abraham Lincoln facing towards the right direction, and the back side has an engraved phrase, e pluribus unum, which translates from Latin to English as, out of many, now one. Also, keep that in mind. This Lincoln cent coin, which is worth exactly one one hundredth of a dollar, has been minted since the year of 1909 and beyond. It was said that this penny is to commemorate Abraham Lincoln's 100th birthday, but of course this story was created just to cover up its actual hidden message that is being blatantly displayed throughout the creation of this coin, literally. The Lincoln cent penny is used not just to commemorate the 100th birthday of Abraham Lincoln, but it also commemorates the signing of the Homestead Act of 1862 due to Lincoln being the president that actually signed this particular act into law. And in the year of 1909, when this coin was minted, this Homestead Act was being amended to further allow white European and white African immigrants to populate these American lands by law. On March 3rd, 1909, which was the very last day of his second presidential term, Theodore Roosevelt signed what Congress calls the Act of 1909. But the hidden truth is that this law is the Enlarged Homestead Act of 1909, a brand new amendment very similar to its 1862's predecessor. This new homestead law perfected the purchasing of Indian lands removed the restrictions on these lands, authorized the sale of these lands, referring to them as public lands, and also allowed for an enlarged homestead, or rather a greater amount of lands to be given to the white immigrants. What is also very important to note here is that there is a clause at the end of this amendment that states, quote, nothing shall affect the rights of the entrymen in which these entrymen are the people migrating to these lands under this homestead act, making the lands of America their new homestead, which in turn makes them lawfully native to America. And quote, under the provisions of this law, nothing can be changed, in which this law single-handedly negates each and every treaty that was signed with our ancestors. See, 
That is the exact reason why these coins were created in the first place. Because upon their circulations, it sends the encrypted message to the elite that their plans are being carried out successfully. So now you know that it is not a coincidence that Abraham Lincoln carried out the final parts of this hidden agenda, which allowed for these lands to be stolen freely by a one-sided law system which is why his alleged image is purposely engraved on the penny, being held as the lowest denomination of value ever within our economic currency. And now you are also aware that it is not ironic that Benjamin Franklin was appointed to initially create this plan, and also ordered to remind the other white colonizationalists in 1787 with that encrypted message stating to quote, mind your business, or in other words, don't forget what you are here for, in which Franklin's image is purposely printed on the $100 bill, being held as the highest denomination of value ever in our economic currency for that exact reason.